Rachel, this is when the killer is first to arrive. Be a terror murderer, send this was it. Where are you at? Where are you at? Okay, what's going on? I don't even know. You don't know what's going on? Is he breathing? Oh my god. My husband's dead. Okay, is that your husband? My husband's freaking out. Yes, it's my friend. Elizabeth, God, die! Yes, it's quite well. There's one everywhere. Oh my god, he has a gun pointed in the back of his head. What is this? Uh oh. In May 2017, police in the small, quiet town of Bel Air, Ohio, find a man dead. When police arrive on the scene, they meet with the husband and wife that had found the deceased man. David Kinney and his wife Cherry are longtime friends of the victim, 43-year-old Brad McGarry. I can't not believe that. Eight, nine years. Oh, yeah. My kids call him uncle. We supposed to go to the Bahamas with us in August. Uh, you see the killer? Yeah, he's one of my best friends. He met him in coal mining classes years ago, and we just took him and his family. Brad McGarry was an openly gay man in a small conservative neighborhood. His friends state that he had just ended a relationship with a man named Scotty, but they didn't know his last name. Scotty. While looking around the house, police noticed that it appears to have been ransacked. Oddly enough, they noticed that nothing has actually been taken. There were multiple newer phones lying around, a large TV, and even money on the floor. Police are convinced that the robbery was staged. The next thought is that it was suicide. Whoever sought him there immediately. Detectives begin interviewing friends and family of Brad right away, trying to form a timeline and gain as much information as possible as to who may have done this. After getting the full name of Scotty Butler, Brad's recently ex-boyfriend, they head to his house right away to interrogate him. When detectives arrive at the house, his mother answers the door and states that Scotty has been in jail for the past three months for violating his probation. Scotty Three Butler months. is no longer a suspect, as he had a solid alibi. Okay. Detectives decide to take a look around the neighborhood so to see if there suspect. are any cameras filming towards Brad's house. Thankfully, one neighbor had a camera that faced towards the street near Brad's house. They would be able to see who came and went from the house. While reviewing the camera footage, they continue to interview friends and family. David had taken some pictures and screenshots that could help detectives in the investigation so they took his phone to copy the information. The issue the detective is having at this moment is that just the night before, Brad's cousin said something that completely changed the direction of the investigation. Sunday, we went to Grammy's. We were sitting around the table, it was just me and Brad and Heather, which is another cousin of mine, and he made a comment how this DJ guy, he was coming over. Brad's intent was it was romantic. He made a joke about taking a nap. And it wasn't taking a nap. It, he was insinuating that they were having sex. It was like quotation marks. This was and, Sunday. Uh -huh. This was Sunday. Yeah, he was killed. Yes. What time did he leave? Between 1.30 and 2. Really? Yes, he was supposed to. He was dropping all the tuxes off. 
I also know that he was married. They were married. Uh, Brad did. Brad did. Yeah. She, being the wife, didn't know all this time. They've been doing this for years. From what I understand, the two of them, Brad and DJ, kind of, I don't know if they laid low or they completely broke up. I guess they call him DJ or David Kenny. Really? Yes. The only guy. Kenny. The only guy he's ever told me about. It's just, it's the guy. That's him. That's him. Coincidence. Made David believe they took his phone for the pictures he had, but the truth was they were tracking where his phone was when Brad was murdered, uh -uh. as well as finding proof that him and Brad had a relationship beyond friends. When they took a look at his phone, even though he has deleted everything, they are able to see the text messages between David and Brad. Evidence shows that they oh, were no. in fact in a sexual relationship. They review the phone history and find that David's phone was directly at Brad's house at the time of the murder. Wow. They also discover, while reviewing the neighbor's CCTV footage, that David had driven to Brad's right before the murder in his wife's car, then left 40 minutes later. David would then appear again hours later in his truck with his family, delivering the weed eater Brad supposedly wanted to borrow. Police know that David was there when Brad was killed. Now they need to work to get the truth out of David. Where's your phone pointing you at Brad's house the time he got killed in the past three? Oh, no. The piss. You were at his house. Yes, sir. I'm in the room. Do you know exactly when he was killed? Yes, sir, I know. You were there when he was killed. No, sir, I was not at his house when that man was murdered, sir. I can't. This is a guy who thinks he's more trouble. He knows. He's not defending himself. Oh, not even defending him. Uh, I guess he resists them. Okay, okay he left her. He's still lying. Doing this job for many years, the detective knows that people subconsciously hide their face when lying, especially from police. Uh -oh. The police also know that Brad's SUV was still at the house and had not left since Brad was killed. So this version of David's story is a lie. Liar. There was another man there. I swear to you, God, I did not know his name. I did not know his name. I did kind of have a little bit of an argument. Yes, sir. And he was going to shoot me. All right. All right, that's good. The detective now creates a false story to help David become more comfortable with opening up about what happened. Even though the detective knows David will lie again, he also knows that the truth 
is getting closer. Getting closer to the trip. Resent to shoot him. You ain't no papa. This quality. Did it to be. After this statement, David stops talking and asks okay. for a lawyer. And even though he says he, he shot Brad, he will go to court pleading not guilty. In February 2018, David was convicted of aggravated murder with a gun specification. This man was able to do a assassin's job to someone he loved and his best friend. What could he do to his enemy? or someone who opposed him. Kinney, for his part, did offer a brief apology in court, although he made neither an admission nor did he offer an explanation. I would like to apologize to the Gary family for all the hurt and pain that I put you through. And I'm not trying to visit okay. him, I wish you could all, back and take it all back. I know all the apologies in the world will never bring him back, but I want you to know I truly am sorry for it all. The defendant shall serve life in prison Nice. Without the possibility of parole, plus three years beyond life in prison. Prison records indicate that David remains incarcerated at the Belmont Correctional Institution in okay. St. Clairsville, Ohio. Because he's ending them. It's crazy how he did on a pet crank and all these cases were. He's on a bit of a hospital. 